I'll start by just uh, reminding folks sort of where we are in the semester. Not that you don't know that, but just because it helps keep myself organized. So just as a reminder, we are officially wrapping up lab one this week. Many of you have already finished lab one and working on lab two, which is great, but officially lab one will end for the Monday people today, uh, Tuesday people tomorrow and Wednesday people on Wednesday. So what that means is your lab one reports will be due a week from today if you're in the Monday section, tomorrow if you're in the Tuesday section and Wednesday if you're in the Wednesday section. So sometime today, either after this lecture or after today's lab section, you can expect to see a Canvas assignment pop up on, on Canvas. And it's just gonna ask you for a PDF document, which is your lab report. And I'll remind you again that the place to go look for information about that lab report is the policy page on the course website. Um, that page contains information about each section that we expect for you to include in the report. And it even includes some example reports. So I've gotten a couple of questions about things like, is there any length requirement for these reports or what level of depth should we get into in the reports? Use those examples as a rough guideline and use the, uh, um, use that web page as a guideline to get into. And a, you know, if you're a, a heuristic to kind of go on with regard to level of depth that is appropriate is imagine that the audience for this lab report is yourself in like two or three years. And imagine that you haven't been working on, on this stuff in the meantime. So it's all still in there, but some cobwebs have grown over, you know, the stuff related to PIC32. And imagine that in two years, you have to recreate your project in something like a day, recreate it and understand it. Write your lab report to approximately la that level of depth, right? So enough that someone who has, is familiar with this material, but it's maybe not at top of mind, could read through it and understand what you were thinking and put together what you put together. Okay. Any lab report questions? There's nothing in these reports that's particularly unusual. Uh, it's just sort of normal lab report stuff. I will direct you to the bottom of each lab assignment page. There might be a few lab specific items to include in the lab report. So like for lab one, I believe one of the extra items that we ask you to include is a spectrogram of your bird call, which by the way, I might've mentioned this before, but I can't remember. There's an easy way and there's a hard way to generate those spectrograms. And you can do either one that you prefer. Um, the slightly harder way is to record microphone input audio onto the lab PC into a WAV file, and then to import that WAV file into a MATLAB or Python file and write a program that generates a spectrogram. And that's not that difficult. And in fact, in the lab write up, there's some Python code that does that so that you can look at that for a guideline. Alternatively, if you would like, you can use the waveforms application on the lab PCs, which uses the sound card as a uh, um, oscilloscope, and that software will generate spectrograms for you automatically. You have to play with the settings a little bit to get the vertical range to look right and those sorts of things, but it'll it'll generate the spectrograms from the audio input, and that's perhaps the path of least resistance for generating those things. And I'm perfectly okay with you generating it like that. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so if there aren't, then what I thought I would do today, given sort of where we are in the semester, which is wrapping up lab one and getting started on lab two, I wanted to take a lecture to do sort of a slight review and regroup and tying up of loose ends. Uh, in the past three or four or five lectures, in each of those lectures, I've gotten through maybe like 85 or 90% of the content that I wanted to get through in each of those, which is good, but it's left, you know, 10 to 15% hanging. And I want to just go clean up all that stuff and cover all the stuff that we haven't quite gotten to in each of these lectures. So it might be a little bit of a scattered discussion today as I move from thing to thing, but I just, I want to make sure we tie up all the loose ends associated with lab one and introducing lab two before we move forward. So that's what I wanted to. And then with any remaining time, um, I want to, talk through anything that you would like to talk more about, whether that's fixed point arithmetic or direct digital synthesis or whatever it may be. And then um, if there's time after that, start brainstorming a little bit more about final projects with, with, with any time that remains. Um, 
because I know some people are kicking around some ideas. So maybe we can just talk about some of those ideas and it'll give other people ideas. Okay, so let me share my screen. I wanna start by just covering a few things that we got most of the way through the introduction of the Boyd's lab last time. There were just a few things that I wanted to get to that we didn't quite get to. And a few questions that I got actually that I thought were good ones. So I wanted to answer for the whole class. Um, one of the, the good questions that I got is someone found a slight error in the algorithm. And I wanna point out the slight error to you. You don't have to fix it. But as you go through implementing this, my expectation is that a lot of you are also gonna observe this and think, do I have to fix that? And I wanna just point it out to you so that you know it when you see it and know that you don't have to fix it and justify why. And this, the, the slight error has to do specifically with the separation step here. And you will recall that what we're doing in the separation step of this algorithm is we're finding all of the other birds that are within this close protected range of the bird that we're updating. And then for each bird that's in that range, we are incrementing two variables by the first one by the difference in the X position between the bird we're updating and the other bird. And the second one by the Y position, the difference of the Y positions between the bird we're updating and the other bird. And then after we've gone through all of these, we update our velocity by this variable that we've been incrementing by those distances scaled by some tunable factor, right? That, that lets you know how much you care about separating from your neighbors. What someone knows, so, so just to clarify what this is doing is say that our bird is at the origin zero, zero and say that we have a bird at two birds within our protected range at say coordinates one, one and coordinates minus one, one. So symmetrically across the positive X axis here, you can go through this and you'll see that the action that the bird that we're updating will take in response to the presence of those two birds is to move in the negative X axis direction. So symmetrically away from both birds. The slight error here is you can see that because we are calculating these differences and they're unnormalized in any way, birds that are at the edge of the farther away from us, but still within our protected range actually get more weight than those that are closer to us. So suppose that we're at the origin zero, zero, and we had a bird at one, one, and another bird at uh, minus two, minus two. The bird at minus two, minus two, because it's a farther distance from us, it actually gets more weight in this calculation. And the consequence will be that the bird that we're updating will move towards the bird that's actually closer at one, one. Which is a slight error because in nature, that's probably not what you expect. You probably expect for the bird to move away from the one that's closest to it. That's probably the one that gets the most weight. So yeah, this is a slight error. If you want to try to come up with a fix for this, you are more than welcome to. You do not need to. And the reason is you will never notice. You're gonna have enough birds in this flock that the specific set of circumstances where this becomes a problem is gonna be fleeting. And it's gonna be in specific locations and your eye will never pick it up. To your eye, it's still gonna look right and the illusion is going to hold. But I just wanted to point this out because some folks have noticed it, more folks will notice it. And the illusion still holds despite this, so I, okay. Um, another question that I got, which was another good one, is the algorithm that we're implementing does nothing to prevent from birds from overlapping. And the question is, is it okay for birds to overlap? I actually view this as a feature rather than a bug. If you prevent the birds from overlap, when the birds overlap, the illusion is that it looks like one is passing in front of and behind the other. It looks quite natural actually when they overlap one another. If you prevent them from overlapping one another, it uh, becomes decidedly 2D and it doesn't look right anymore. So it's okay for these birds to overlap. And in fact, it, it helps the illusion when they overlap. So you don't need to do anything to worry about, um, about that. And you also don't need to worry about What about the situation where they are, suppose they are exactly on top of one another, both are at exactly the same coordinate. Does this create any kind of divide by zero issue? Like, is there any point in this algorithm where we're dividing by the difference in positions of two birds that are close to one another? And the answer is no. So even that circumstance is okay. You're not gonna end up with some divide by zero and a bird shooting off to infinity. 
um, it still updates smoothly because in this separation step of the algorithm, there is no divide here. We're not actually dividing by these separation distances. We're just scaling them. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify those two things. And then the other thing that I wanted to point up, bring up in connection to introducing this lab, which I didn't quite get to in, in the previous lectures, are um, the opportunities for extension. Like, like we've talked about a few times, I like for these labs to be extendable. So if you meet the objectives for the lab and you find them interesting and you wanna keep going, I want for there to be interesting places to go. This particular lab is full of such places. And even if you don't explore all of these things for uh, the lab assignment, some of you might be interested in this sort of stuff for things like final projects. So I just wanna talk about some of the modifications that you can make to this algorithm to make your flock behave in different ways. Um, what, one of the things you can do, and one that I've mentioned a few times and is perhaps the most obvious thing to do is you could add a predator. Um, you could have a void that's following a different set of rules that I would draw in a different color. And this void moves around the screen and, and an additional rule that every other void must follow is avoid that one, right? And you would end up with behavior that looks a lot like a hawk flying through starlings or like a shark swimming through a school of fish where they all split and then reconverge on the other side. And you can extend that even further where you can come up with a specific set of rules for the predator. And you could play with this and see which one looks the most organic, but you might consider doing something like once a void enters the predator's protected range, the predator tries to catch a specific void. That to me seems like the rule that would create the most realistic illusion, but I could be wrong. Um, but, but in effect, the predator would be trying to, to overlap with a specific void that's in its protected range. All the voids would be trying to avoid the predator. And you end up with really cool illusions. So if you want to explore that, you're welcome to. Another thing you might consider doing is um, the flock at present, as, as you'll implement it in the lab, the flock is just flying around on a blank background. You could put stuff in that background. Specifically, you could put something like a tree. You could draw a tree on the background that the, that the birds are flying over. And you could come up with a set of rules that causes birds to perch momentarily on branches and then rejoin the flock. So if a bird is flying in a particular direction, has a particular velocity and is within a particular distance of a branch, you could have it stop on that branch, wait for some number of frames or a random number of frames. I'm not sure which would look better. And then take off and find and rejoin the flock. That could look really cool. Um, and then you could do some other things. You could add gravity. Birds tend to move more quickly when diving than when climbing. So you could implement that. And uh, the other thing you might consider is adding moving foods, a moving food source or moving food sources that would bias the flock on the screen. And it would be pretty cool to make that user controlled so that you as the user could steer your flock around the screen. Along those lines, it might be cool to have a user controlled predator too, so that you could go in and disturb your flock in real time. Okay, so just, just things to think about. By the way, if you're interested in, if you are interested in this sort of behavior in actual animals, there's a cool paper, I can't remember the, I think it's Kuzin is the name of the author. I think he's at Princeton, but I can double check that. But it's, it's a paper with the title something along the lines of decision making in animal herds. And it talks about how these, they're coming to some sort of a uh, consensus, right? Like if you look at something like a herd of elk or something, they're reaching some sort of consensus about where to go. There's a lot of research about how that consensus is reached and it's really interesting. So I'll, I'll Google that after lecture and put a link somewhere if people are interested in this. Okay, any questions about these loose ends? And then I wanna move on to some other loose ends. Anyone have a bird flying around yet? Okay, that's okay. So the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, wrapping up some fixed point discussion. So this is a document that is essentially a uh, slightly gussied up version of the document that we put together in lecture last time. 
uh, just with a little bit more expository text to make it readable. And I, I included the link to this document in a Canvas site. So if you can find that, you should be able to find it and access it. In any case, uh, we got through all of this with the exception of one last topic, which is gonna be relevant for lab two, which is uh, generating random numbers within particular ranges in fixed point. So I just want to talk about how to do that. Um, it's not particularly complicated. You just like, like with the multiply routines that we talked about last time, you need to be a little bit thoughtful about where you are placing bits under with keeping in mind where you have decided to place a decimal point. Okay. So the way that you can, can generate a random number in, uh, in fixed point is by taking advantage of a routine that's made available to you in, it's the RAND function. I think it's in the standard lib library is where that actually comes from. Um, but for us, RAND, R-A-N-D, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, when you call that, it will return a, a uniformly distributed pseudo random short. That is a, a, a value of type short, which is to say a value that is 16 bits long. So when you call RAND, you will generate 16 random bits, or in other words, you'll generate a uniformly distributed random number between zero and two to the 16, which is 65,536, okay? Now, if you were to take that uniformly distributed random number and cast it to a fix, we talked about how these type conversions take place between something like an int and something like a fix last time, what you would end up doing is left shifting by however many bits are in the fractional part of your fixed point number. So in our case, we would end up, if we were doing a int to fix conversion, for example, suppose that we generated a random number and stored it in an int, then we would have 16 random bits. And when we casted it to an accumulate, we would end up left shifting it by 15 which would actually create a random number in the range of zero up to what? Two to the 15 or two to the 16, right? Which is maybe not what you want. Maybe you want a random number between something like zero and one or minus one and one. So the process by which you can generate a random number with, within a desired range is the following. You call rand, which will generate 16 random bits. And in this case, we're just adding it with a bunch of ones, which is to say every bit that's generated, we keep that bit as that bit. If you wanted, say, if you wanted to um, less than 16 random bits, you could change this mask, right? So maybe you only want 12 random bits. So you would and you would end this with zero x zero fff. We want 16 random bits, so we're going to end it with ffff f. f is that four f's? Four f's. So generate 16 random bits. We then um, cast it to a fix, which is going to shift it left by 15 bits. And then what we want to do is generate a random, a, a random fix between zero and one, which means we want our randomly, our randomly generated bits to be in bits 15 to zero. So you can think about this about, uh, when we cast it to a fix, our randomly generated bits will be in bits 31 to 16. We want to shift by as many as is required to move the randomly generated bit in bit 16 down to zero and the randomly generated bit in bit 31 down to bit 15, which is a shift right by 16. So we generate 16 random bits, cast to a fix, that shifts everything up. And then we cast, or we shift right rather, to move those bits to wherever they need to be under our assumption about where the, uh, the decimal point is to generate a number that's in the range that we desire. So shifting right by 16 will generate a fix between zero and one. And that's because our randomly generated bits will be, after that shift, they will be in bits 15 to zero. Does that make sense? So we look up here, we are placing, we generate 16 random bits. When we cast to a fix, they get shifted up. And then we're shifting them back down so that they land down here in the fractional 15 bits. So that these end up being 
randomly generated, and these will be zero. And that'll give us a, number, a random number between, a uniformly distributed random number between zero and one. And then by playing with how much you shift, and by adding and subtracting constants, and by adding and subtracting these randomly generated uniform, uni uniformly distributed random values together, you can create random values that are in different ranges. So for example, suppose you wanted a random fix between minus one and one. Well, we do the same thing that we did before, except instead of shifting down by 15, we shift down by 15. Oh. Instead of shifting down by 16, we shift down by 15. That places our bits in the range uh, 16 to one. So in other words, our randomly generated bits now start here and end here. That's going to produce, if we don't do any, if, we, if that's where we stop, then that will produce a random number between zero and two. If we subtract one off of that, then we get a random number between minus one and one. Make sense? So we're playing this game where we're generating random bits, casting it to a fix with shifts them to some place in that, that uh, those 32 bits, it puts them somewhere. And then we're moving them by shifting them to wherever they need to be to create a different range. And then if necessary, subtracting off some value to correct that range, make it symmetric about zero. Couple more examples. How about a random fix between minus two and two? Well, generate 16 random bits, cast it to a fix, that shifts everything up. Shift down by 14. That's gonna create a random number between zero and four. And then if we subtract off two, we end up with a random number between minus two and two. Okay. And then you can do combinations of these things. Suppose you wanted a random fix between minus 1.5 and 1.5. Well, you could generate one random number in the range zero to two, a second random number in the range zero, zero to one, and then you subtract off 1.5. And that can give you a random fix in the range minus 1.5 to 1.5. So you're playing these games, right? You're shifting bits around wherever they need to be, and then you are subtracting off constants and adding together these random values as necessary in order to create a uniformly distributed random number in the range that you desire. There are questions about this. The reason this is relevant for lab two is you are asked when you, when you initialize your flock, when you generate a new void, you're asked to give it a randomized position and velocity. This is how you will randomize those things. What if you wanted a Gaussian distributed random number? What if you didn't want uniform distribution? What if you wanted Gaussian distribution? Anybody remember some, from statistics how you could do that? Anybody remember the central limit theorem? So, so a bunch, uh, the, what the central limit theorem states is if you sum together a bunch of independent random numbers with probability density functions that aren't necessarily Gaussian. And in fact, they can be pretty much anything. If you sum them together, their sum will produce a Gaussian distribution or something that approximates a Gaussian distribution. The more that you sum, the more it approaches Gaussian. So an example of this would be like, suppose you're flipping a coin, heads or tails, heads or tails, heads or tails. The more times you flip, the number of heads that you will get will end up being approximated by a Gaussian distribution centered at half the number of coin flips. So if you flip a hundred times, you're gonna end and you're looking at the distribution for possible number of heads that you'll get after a hundred coin flips, you'll end up with an approximately Gaussian distribution centered at 50 and then distributed approximately Gaussian. One of these weird things that seems like it shouldn't that shouldn't be the way that it is, but it is the way that it is. So what this means is if you wanna generate Gaussian distributed random numbers, you can add together a bunch of independent uniformly distributed random numbers and the sum will end up being Gaussian distributed. The more that you add, the better that approximation. And maybe you normalize, right? Maybe you're doing something like the average instead of the sum and that's fine. 
Um, but that's how you would generate a Gaussian distributed random number if you wanted to. Okay. Let's look at some, let's look at some example code. Um, so I talked about how we, ended, how we wrapped up last time was talking about how if you include standard fix.h, standard fix.h file in your, um, in your source code, then as described on this web page, you get access to a bunch of these fixed point data types just built in. And the compiler understands that these are fixed point and treats them appropriately. So the one that's of particular relevance for you for lab two is this fixed point of type underscore accume, which is a 16.15 fixed point, 16 integer bits, 15 fractional bits, exactly the same uh, number of integer and fractional bits as the one that we were considering in this document. And the advantage of using uh, these built-in types, if they fit your range and resolution requirements is you can just use the uh, normal looking symbols to do arithmetic and the compiler will apply fixed point arithmetic. So if you have two, two variables of type accume and you multiply them by calling variable one asterisk variable two, as you would with anything else, then the compiler will see, oh, that's of type accume, that's of type accume. I'm gonna apply fixed point arithmetic where I see that asterisk and it'll just do it for you, which means that you don't have to write all those routines that we considered last time. Um, and it gives you a, a considerable performance increase. So I thought it would be useful to take a look at this in action and in particular, I want to look at the example file that I point you to in the recommended program organization for lab one. And it is this animation example. Let me put this in Sublime so it's a little more readable. So if we take a look at this, uh, view syntax, see. So if we take a look at this, um, this is the example that, sorry, I'm just moving the zoom window somewhere out of the way. Uh, this is the example that we recommend that you start with for working on your animation for lab two. And I just wanna talk through this because it uses that type of cube so you can see how that's used. And it also gives you some hints about program organization and about some opportunities for optimization. So. Relatively speaking, compared to the demo, the demo uh, file that we've been using as sort of the starting point for a lot of these labs, this one's quite simple in comparison. It only contains two threads. One of those threads is just a timer that's keeping track of a timer and displaying a timer. And the other one is doing animation. So the one that's doing animation is the one that we'll look at the most, but I'll, I'll point out both. Um, everything in here, well, let's start with the timer thread. So this first thread, the timer starts as usual with a PT begin, sets a cursor position, sets a text color, writes a string to the TFT display. A reminder, by the way, that you can do this um, because this is a capability that with the ability to write to the serial console and that Python interface, this is something that perhaps folks didn't realize that they could do. You can write text to the TFT display if you want. Uh, and perhaps depending on how you're debugging, that's useful to you but this writes a string to the TFT display, yields for one second, increments of system time measured in seconds, um, draws over where the text was with black, which is effectively erasing the text, sets a cursor position, sets a text color, calls sprintf um, to put the system time into this character buffer and then writes that character buffer to the screen. So all that this is doing is incrementing a, a timer at one Hertz, one tick per second, and then writing the time to the screen. Why is it a good idea to have a thread like this in your program while you're debugging? What do you know? It's a good idea to give your code a heartbeat. 
right? Some observable heartbeat. In this case, the heartbeat of our code is a timer that's incrementing. Maybe you implement it so that the heartbeat is an LED flashing, but it's some, some visually obvious thing that makes it clear to you that the code is running at all, that it's not hung somewhere, right? So by just incrementing a timer, this isn't, this isn't of course, really adding any value to the animation. All that this is doing is making us, the developer, aware that this thread is getting scheduled and it's getting scheduled at the rate that we expect for it to get scheduled, which actually is a lot of information when it comes to debugging problems. You can at least scratch all of that sort of stuff off as being potential issues if you see your heartbeat beating. Okay, so at least while you're debugging, it's a very good idea to give your code a pulse and to monitor that pulse. But okay, um, if we scroll down to the next thread, this is where sort of the, the interesting stuff actually takes place. You can see a couple of macros defined, which are um, essentially just allowing for us to use shorthand to do type conversions between type accume and types float and int. So in the lecture, we saw how to do these sorts of conversions um, if we were creating our own fixed point value. One of the advantages of using the compiler understood fixed point data types is these type casts are done exactly how they're done between any other type cast. So, you know, in the same way that you can take some float and call parentheses int on that float to cast it to an int, you can take some, uh, some float here, A, and call parentheses accume on A, and you get the accume representation of that value. And you don't have to do any of that footwork associated with shifting bits around. That's kind of nice. So float to accume just becomes the cast of float A to type accume. Accume to float just becomes the cast of A of type accume to float, just normal type casting. Um, and then similarly for, for int to accume, we cast A to accume and for accume to int, we cast A to int, right? So just all looks normal, which is nice. And then what we do next is this is, you can see an initialization of uh, a bunch of variables that we'll use in this animation thread. What this animation is doing, I should mention, if you, if you program your pick with this code and run it, what you will see is a little ball follows a, an approximately ballistic trajectory to the bottom of the screen and then bounces along the screen. So it's, it's uh, ballistic motion under the influence of gravity and then bouncing when it hits a wall with energy dissipation. So it bounces less high and then less high and then less high and it sort of skips in a physical looking way, it bounces across the screen. So this is just declaring some initial conditions for things like our X position, Y position, X and Y velocities, and things like the gravitational and drag constants. The equations that we're implementing here are ballistic motion under the influence of gravity and some, some drag that's related to the velocity of the ballistic. Um, and you can see how these casts take place. It's, it's, we have some integer, we want to represent it as a cum, so we call it into a cum on that integer and we get some a cum out, which we'll store in xc and similarly for everything else. So for you, you might be calling these sorts of type conversions on as you move sliders to change various parameters in the Boyd's algorithm, the slider value is probably going to be of type int and you're gonna to have to change that to type a cube. So we're doing these sorts of conversions. And like I mentioned last time, and like what's happening here, do these conversions before the animation loop. Don't be doing type conversions in your animation loop. Some of them are cheap. Converting from fix to int is cheap. It still costs you some cycles. So don't do them if you don't have to to do them, but certainly don't do conversions between float and fix in your animation loop. That costs you a lot. So don't do that in the animation loop. And then what actually happens in this loop? As usual, we call begin and then we drop into a while one loop. This yields for a particular amount of time. In this case, it yields for 32 milliseconds. 32 milliseconds. So that's 30 frames per second animation rate approximately slightly faster, but about 30, 30 frames per second animation rate. 
And then it goes through the following steps. It draws a black circle over the X and Y position of the ball that's being animated. That is effectively erasing the ball. So it erases the ball. It updates the X and Y velocities of the ball. This is, this is Euler integration of, of ballistic motion. We can talk through this if you want, but um, this is Euler integration of the acceleration that the ball is feeling, which comes from drag and comes from gravity in the Y direction and comes only from drag in the X direction. So it updates the X and Y velocities and then uses those updated velocities to update the X and Y positions of the ball. We talked about this last time because of our choice of units, we're using position units of pixels and we're using velocity units of pixels per frame because this is an Euler integration by one frame, the delta T that you would typically expect next to your velocity terms is one because we're time stepping by one frame. So the position updates become very simply new position is old position plus velocity, updated velocity. We do a couple of bounds checking here to see if we have hit a boundary. Um, if our X position is within five pixels of the bottom of the screen or our X position is, uh, or I guess within five pixels of the left or right of the screen, then we, we invert it, which is to say, you know, if we're going like this and we're, we see a wall here, we just boink, go the other direction. So it's just bouncing. And the same is true of Y. If we are at the bottom of the screen, then the velocity is inverted so that it bounces off the ground and back up into the air, and then it'll bounce back down again. There is no bounce check here for the top of the screen. Why? Because gravity is pulling this ball down, so it's not going to go through the top of the screen. And then with our updated positions, we redraw the ball that we erased up here in green at its new X and Y positions. Wait for another 32 milliseconds and then do it again. So for you guys in the Boyd's lab, you will go through this process for every Boyd in your flock. You will, for the Boyd that you're updating, you will erase that Boyd. You will calculate its, its updated velocities by going through the algorithm that we talked a lot about a couple of lectures ago. So this involves looking at every other Boyd and adjusting your velocity based on what you see based on the separation rules, the alignment rules and the cohesion rules and turning around at screen edges and such. So you'll update the velocities. Before you update the positions, you'll do those uh, check for speed. You'll make sure that your updated velocity doesn't exceed the speed limit or drop below the lower speed limit. And then with your updated velocity for that void, you'll update that void's position and then you'll redraw it. And you'll do that for every void in the flock. And the deadline is you need to do that for every void 30 times a second. So some things to think about in the direction of optimization here. I'll just pull up my notes so I don't miss any of these. You will notice here that so a, a strategy that you might consider, a bad strategy that you might consider is instead of erasing and redrawing each void, what if you erase the whole screen, computed the updated positions of each void and then redrew all the voids. So there was just one erase step and one redraw step. Why is that a bad idea? This is a 240 by 320 TFT display. We're writing to that TFT display through an SPI channel with a baud rate of 20 megahertz, which is pretty fast. But if you are erasing every pixel on that TFT display, that's how many pixels? That's 240 by 320. That's 76,800 pixels. That's a lot of transactions. That's going to cost you a lot of time. So don't do that. If a pixel doesn't need to be updated, don't update it. Don't erase pixels that don't need to be erased. Only erase exactly the pixels that, that correspond to one void. Erase this void, update it, redraw that void. So then you're not erasing a whole screen and redrawing a whole screen, which is costly. 
you are only erasing and redrawing the relevant pixels. And do it void by void because this leads to less, uh, it, it, it leads to a smoother looking animation. If you're erasing every void and then updating each void, you can end up with things looking a little herky jerky. If you're updating them, each one is being updated at 30 frames per second, but the updates are slightly out of phase with one another perhaps. Void one is being updated, you know, at CPU cycle or at millisecond zero, 30, 60, et cetera. Void two might be getting updated at, at 1, 31, 61, et cetera. So they're slightly out of phase, but each one is individually getting updated at 30 frames per second. That's gonna give you a really smooth looking look. Um, what other things do I want to say here? Um, the other thing, and I mentioned this, this a little bit, is this TFT fill circle, okay? In, in this example, we are drawing this ball with this fill circle routine. Let me just open up, I think I have it downloaded. Uh, do I, maybe I don't. That's okay. If you open up the, um, if you open up the TFT header file where all of these routines are defined, as I mentioned previously, but I, I wanna mention it again, this fill circle routine is expensive. So what this allows for you to do is provide the routine with the center coordinate of a circle and with the radius of that circle and the color of that circle. And it will run an algorithm to, com to com figure out which pixels it should color in order to create a circle that is, a shape that approximates a circle that is four pixels in this case in radius. Figuring out which of those pixels to color is, it, this algorithm works really well, but it's, it's costly. So a alternative that you might consider is to write your own routine here. Maybe you call it TFT fast circle or something where just like this one, you provide it with X and Y um, center coordinates, but you'll decide on some fixed size of that circle, the, the circle that you're using to represent a void, you will do some experiment to see what size, what size is the smallest I can manage that I can still resolve on the webcam. You'll figure out whatever that is. And then you will, you will tell it which pixels to draw radially out from these two centers without doing the computation to figure out. Does, it, does this make sense? So if you provide the two centers, it will just know, okay, I'm supposed to color this set of pixels as computed relative to the center. So the one immediately up, immediately out, immediately down, immediately over, and then you know filling in the gaps. You'll figure out which of those circles creates a good circle, which of those pixels creates a good circle shape, and then you'll just stamp them down. So you're not doing the computation to figure out which pixels to color. You're doing that beforehand and then just telling it which ones to color given a center coordinate. And they don't have to be circles. If you wanna make your voids squares, that's okay, I guess. I guess that's okay. Um, if you wanna make them little birds, <laughs> it's probably expensive, but the artistic among you might find that interesting. Questions about this? Something else to just note, because I've seen this error a couple times. Be careful when you're combining demo code. Um, each, each of the pieces of demo code will run on its own and you can load it on the pick and, and it works just fine. Some of them create and schedule threads using slightly different conventions that are not compatible with one another. So just make sure, is this an example? Yeah, so for example, in this thread, you can see that we're calling PT init on every thread that's in this program. And in the, in the demo code, we're doing something different where we're adding all of those threads to the scheduler and then only calling PT init on scheduler thread. Just make sure that there's consistency there. And, and probably the, the easiest thing to do is follow this convention, right? So definitely follow this convention. If I can insert a comment, the the bouncing ball example was written before I hacked the scheduler to be 
more consistent. So you, as, as you say, use the modern version of the scheduler, which is what you're pointing to here, and not the version in the bouncing ball. Everything else about those examples works just fine. So you can, you can use those threads, just be careful with how you actually schedule them, mostly down here in main. The only thing that's gonna be really different is how these things get scheduled in main. So just pay attention to that. Questions about this? Okay.